Our God is on His throne ruling the affairs of men. God does not change. His truths have not changed. He's promised a witness in the church according to the election of grace in all ages that will stand for the old paths, defending His truth. The Primitive Baptist Digital Library is pleased to present the Word of Sovereign Grace. Timely video messages based on the King James Bible and the doctrines taught by Christ and the Apostles. Again, for the James, we've learned to love and appreciate him and all of these other elders that are here tonight and have come in from other places. We appreciate your presence. <coughs> Thank you for your love and, and your prayers. We have a few that have come in tonight that weren't here last night. We may have lost a few, uh, but anyway, we're happy to see all of you and thank the Lord for your presence. Last evening, we tried to speak upon the subject, I would say, of hope. And what that hope is, of course, it went to the resurrection naturally because that's what that hope is, the resurrection and the second coming of our Lord. Paul said, you write in Titus, you remember, uh, <clears throat> that looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing tied together because that's when they'll both take place. A blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Tonight I want to speak to you on a little different subject. If the Lord shall bless our thoughts for a little while to speak to you. I want to speak to you of what it should be, what we should do, and what we should be uh, when we have this hope. When this hope swells our breasts, and when we think of this, uh, as one of the elders told me, he said, I've thought about that all day today, what you uh, spoke on last night. When the Word of God, when the truth of God's Word, when the blessedness of these truths are upon our minds day by day, uh, what effect should it have on us? What should we uh, be the results of that? I want to go tonight, if the Lord shall bless us for a while, to the 26th chapter of the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 26, uh, we find some words that I want to call to your attention. First of all, let me kind of bring you up to date in this 20th sixth chapter before we get to what we want to speak to you on. The Apostle Paul <coughs> is a prisoner. Paul has not killed anyone. Paul has not robbed a bank. Paul has not beaten his wife. Paul has not abused his children. Paul has not failed to pay his income tax. But Paul is a prisoner. <clears throat> and Paul says the reason that he's a prisoner, he's bound, he said, for the hope of Israel. That is because he believes in, he's preaching, he's teaching that the Lord Jesus Christ, <clears throat> that Jesus that was born in Bethlehem Ephratah, that he's a believer in him, that he used to persecute him, he used to kill people that did believe in him, he put them in jail, he put them in chains, he stoned them as he did Stephen, he was responsible for that, and he never got over it. As long as he lived, Paul's heart bore the marks of standing watching Stephen as he was stoned to death. <coughs> Paul had looked upon that and held the coats of those that were stoning him. And those spears continually pricked the heart of the Apostle Paul. 
He saw Stephen as his face shined. He heard him as he declared that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, was standing at the right hand of God. And Paul remembered that. And he said, for that hope, I'm bound in these chains. Paul comes down in the first part of that 26th chapter. And he asks the question as he stands before Agrippa and Festus and Bernice. And a great crowd of witnesses that had gathered there to hear this trial. And Paul says to Agrippa, that's who he's really addressing. He's already uh, been before Festus. He's already been before Felix. Now he's before Agrippa. And Paul said, should it be thought something incredible with you that God should raise the dead? Is that, should that be something incredible with you? If I got the story next week or the next week or next year, if I got the story that Brother Roten had raised somebody from the dead, yes, I'd be a little surprised. And yes, I'd wonder what in the world's going on up there in the mountain. What kind of circus are they trying to put on? How did they get this rumor going that Brother Roten raised somebody from the dead? It would be an incredible thing to me. And what I'm saying about Brother Roten, I can say about anybody here, including myself. It would be a thing incredible if that story got out, that one of us had raised the dead. But should it be thought anything incredible? That God should raise the dead? Certainly not. Not the primitive Baptists. You say, well, shouldn't it be incredible to other people? It should be from one standpoint, but from another standpoint, it shouldn't be. They don't believe that God raises from the dead anyway. You say, well, I, I think everybody believes that. I beg to differ with you. Amen. I beg to differ with you. I understand Billy Graham starting a crusade in Charlotte tonight. So I would encourage you tomorrow night, if you think that uh, uh, everybody believes that God raises the dead, I would encourage you to go down to Charlotte tomorrow night. Don't come to hear me. Go hear him. And he'll tell you if you'll make a decision. That's what he'll tell you. All you have to do is decide whether you want to go to heaven or whether you want to go to hell. There's no resurrection of the dead in that. Absolutely not. But I didn't tell you that last night. I'm not going to tell you that tonight. And unless I lose my mind, I won't tell you that tomorrow night. I'm going to tell you that if you have a hope in Christ, that God raised you sometime in the past. Amen. God raised you from a death in trespasses and sin to a life in Christ Amen. Jesus. And you were passing in it. You didn't decide anything. God did. That's right. God did. Should it be thought something incredible to you that God hath raised one from the dead? Why it shouldn't be? That's just everyday work with God. He does that all the time. All the time. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and in sin. He does that all the time. It takes the same power to raise one from a death in trespasses and sin as it took to raise the Lord Jesus Christ out of that tomb that he took the same power. So you see, that's no big thing with us. 
And Paul, this primitive Baptist preacher, this apostle, Paul thought it was, you know, something that uh, should be understood. It shouldn't be a thing thought incredible, said Paul. So as Paul stands before Agrippa, this, uh, this man that, that knows and understands something of the Jewish religion, Paul says to this man, Should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? Then he goes on to tell him what took place on the road to Damascus in this 26th chapter. And in this 26th chapter, as he gives that lesson of what took place on the road to Damascus, it's quite different to what we hear many times. We hear Paul giving this account. And Paul says in verse 14, verse 13, he says, At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. I haven't got to my text yet, but I'll get to it in a little while. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, now this got Paul's attention. This got his attention. Paul had been persecuting those who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this happened back in the ninth chapter of the book of Acts. Paul's relating it to Agrippa here. <clears throat> and Paul said he spake in the Hebrew tongue. And here's what he said. Saul, Saul. Why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. I just mentioned that a little while ago. His heart had been pricked ever since the day he stood and watched them stone Stephen and heard Stephen preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. His heart had been pricked. I want to ask you a question. That's the best way of teaching I know is by asking questions. That's the way our Lord taught. You can't improve upon Him. Can you prick the heart of a dead alien sinner? Do you prick the heart of one who is dead and trespasses in sin? If I read my Bible correctly, and I know I do because I read it over many, many times, right here in this same book of Acts, I go back to the second chapter of the book of Acts, and I find the Apostle Peter standing up on the day of Pentecost preaching, and I hear 3,000 souls whose hearts have been pricked. For I hear them crying out in that second chapter of Acts. Men and brethren, what shall we do? And here's what Peter said. Repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Their hearts were pricked. You come over to the 8th chapter, 7th and 8th chapters of the book of Acts, and you find preaching again. Here's someone preaching in this chapter, and instead of their hearts being pricked, and instead of them crying out, what must we do? The Bible says they were cut to the heart and they gnashed with their teeth. What's the answer? You can cut a stone but you can't prick it. Try pricking a stone. You won't get anywhere pricking a stone. You can cut it 
They've even got they've even got blades now that you can take a a, a skill saw and cut stone. You can cut a stone, but you can't break it. So what did the Lord do? What does the Bible say the Lord did? He didn't say he told them to make a decision. He didn't say he told them to change their ways and, and do a little better. He didn't tell them to clean up and sweep around their own door and get things in shape. What did the Lord say he did? He said he took away that heart of stone. He took it away and gave them in the place of it a heart of flesh. You can prick flesh. You can prick flesh. See, I don't know who I'm preaching to. I don't know what these elders up here believe happened on the road to Damascus. I don't have a compass up here with me. I'm just on the sea. So what am I going to do? Just what I've always done. I'm going to follow this book. That's my compass. What happened on the road to Damascus? Saul, Saul. I hear it said from time to time, but that was two calls. One from death and trespasses and sin to alive in Christ Jesus, and another one to apostleship. But I'm not going to buy that. You say, well, that's the way I've always heard it. That's the way I believe it. Well, I'm going to do my best to change your belief tonight. I want you to follow. You say, but I know so many preachers, and everyone I know believes it that way. That's still fine. I'm sorry that they're all wrong. But I can't help it if they are, you know. I'm going to stay with the book, and I want you to follow me in the book. Saul, Saul, that's two calls. Why persecutest thou me? Why Saul couldn't touch the Lord? The Lord was in heaven, speaking to him from heaven. He is at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's where Stephen had seen him. That's where he was speaking to Saul from. Why persecutest thou me? How could Saul persecute him? Follow me. Follow me. If you as much as give a cup of cool water in my name under one of these, you've done it unto me. <clears throat> Isn't that what it says, brethren? As much as a cup of cool water. If you've given that to someone, a little child of God, that's thirsty, and you've given them as much as a cup of cool water, you did that unto the Lord. Paul said, why persecutest thou me? He didn't say them. He said me. The apostle Paul teaches us and teaches the people at, at Corinth and other places, but especially Corinth, the Apostle Paul preaches and teaches that Christ is the head of the church and that we are members in particular. Right? He is the head, we are the body. So one of us, probably me, I might be, it might be the little toe, I might be being too uh, ambiguous here by, by saying little finger, it might be the little toe, that's further away. That'd probably be me, the little toe. <coughs> if I cut that little toe, if I, well let me put it, like this, because I've done this and you have too, and you know how it hurts. You got up in the middle of the night, 
Now, I won't turn the light on, wake my wife up. I can find my way around. And you start around through the house, and there's a chair or a bed post or a dresser leg sticking out a foot further than you thought it was because it's in the dark and you're barefooted and you get all these toes past it except that. <laughs> You've done it. Oh, I know you have. I can look at your faces and tell you that. <clears throat> the only reason that hurt, the only reason that hurt was because there is a nerve down there in the end of that toe. And that nerve goes from the end of that toe. It comes up through your leg, and it comes up to your spinal column, and it comes all the way up to the back of your head, and it goes to a nerve to your brain. And when you hit that with that toe like that, that message traveled a lot faster than I can tell you. And it traveled up to your brain and told you that your little toes hurt. Now, don't you listen to me, child of God. The next time you wake up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and your heart is broken, maybe over church troubles, it may be over family troubles. It may be over financial troubles. It may be over death. It may be over sickness of your loved one. Whatever it is, if you wake up and your heart is broken, and you feel, Lord, this pain is greater than I can bear. Just remember this silly little illustration about the toe. And remember, and remember that every time you think about it, every tear that you shed about it, every time your heart aches over it, he feels it. Amen. Because he's the head. And he feels every pain you feel because you are part of his body. That's why he said to Paul, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? I feel every pain, Paul. I felt every stone that you threw or had your men to throw at Stephen. I felt every stone that hit me. I was standing looking down upon the scene and I felt it. Why persecutest thou me? It's hard for thee to kick against the bricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? I said, What? I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. What did Paul leave home say? What had Paul promised the Sanhedrin when he left Jerusalem on this trip? I'm going to put them all in prison. I'll put them in prison. I'll put them in chains. I'll put some of them to death. But I'm going to wipe out this name of Jesus Christ. There'll be no followers of him left when I get back. Watch out, Ananias, he's coming your way. He's coming to Damascus. He's coming to the street called Straight. He's coming for you, Christians. He's coming. He's on his way. But something's happened to him on the road. Now listen what he says in verse 16. But rise and stand up on thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. You think we're going to find out now? I don't know whether you have a red letter Bible or not. 
and be saved to begin with, because somebody's going to get the wrong idea. They say, oh, Brother Tyndall, Brother Tyndall, uh, he, he promotes the Red Letter Bible. No, I don't. I just happen to have it. I'd really rather not have it. You know why? Because the letters in red, my dear friend, are no more true than the letters in black. And some people have a tendency to go through a red letter Bible and say, oh, but this, this right here, I know this is true. That's just as true. Every Amen. word in here is, right. is just as true. But I happen to have one because this, is, this Bible was given to me and uh, it happens to be a red letter edition. But I wanted to say that to you. If, if you don't have one, don't worry about it. You're better off. If you do have one, just read it all the same because it is the same. It's the Word of God. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. Now, if we're ever going to learn, it's the Lord Jesus talking to Saul. And if anybody knows the purpose of him coming to Saul, the Lord ought to know it. And he's the one doing the talking. And he says, this is the purpose I came for. I want you to listen to it. To make thee a minister. Saul. To make thee a minister. And a witness. Saul. Can you get any simpler than that? Is there any way, Brother James, that you can get up here and say it any more simple than that? I don't know how in the world it could be any more simple than that. You would have to study for weeks and months. To make it complicated. It's so simple. I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. Number one, Saul, to make thee a minister. Number two, and a witness. Saul. Both, both, both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. What do you say? I hope I'm understanding you right, but I'm not sure, preacher, whether I'm getting it right or not. I'm not sure I'm understanding what you're saying. Well, I'm going to make it so plain you can't misunderstand it. I don't want you to misunderstand it. I want you to understand what I'm saying. Saul was already a child of God before this happened. God appeared to him on the road to Damascus and made him a minister and a witness. Paul was in the same shape that he wrote about his people in the book of Romans in the 10th chapter. When Paul wrote to them and said, My heart's design prior to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear, bear them record that they have a zeal of God. Will somebody please tell me where do you get a zeal of God? Do you go down to the local five and ten cent store and buy a zeal of God? Where do you get the zeal of God? How can you get the zeal of God? Does a man out here dead in trespasses and sin, does he have the zeal of God? Certainly not. He has to be a child of God to have the zeal of God because it comes from God. Man don't decide to get it. Man don't decide to become a child of God. God calls him from that death and trespasses and sin. 
the Holy Spirit calls him. John 3, the Son calls him. John 5, 25. And the Father calls him. John 8, what is it? John 6, 44. <coughs> the Father calls him, draws him, draws him. Man doesn't do it. And so Paul says, my heart's design, prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. That's the problem. Not according to knowledge. <clears throat> what are you doing, Paul? I'm going to wipe this, this man's name from the face of the earth. Everybody that names his name, I'm either going to kill them, have them killed, or put them in prison. I'm going to wipe his name out. Why, Paul? Because he's an imposter, talking about being God's son, talking about coming down from heaven. <coughs> Why, well, I've studied these Old Testament scriptures all my life. I've been taught them by the greatest teachers. And this is an imposter. <coughs> Do you have a zeal, Paul? Yeah. What's it about? Oh, it's about God. What about Jesus Christ? Oh, no, he's an imposter. No, I'll have nothing to do with him. No, sir. Nothing whatsoever to do with him. Let not your heart be troubled. John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. Watch this statement. This is no question. Watch the statement. Ye believe in God. Who's Jesus talking to? His disciples. What are they? Jews. Jews. Just like Paul. Ye believe in God. Now, what does he say to them? Believe also in me. In me. In me. Believe also in me. <clears throat> For they being ignorant of God's right, back to Romans 10. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, isn't that what Paul didn't do? And that's what these Jews in, in Romans 10 do. Going about to establish their own righteousness. Why? Because they're ignorant of God's righteousness. What is God's righteousness? If you have any righteousness tonight, and I believe you do, if I have any righteousness tonight, what is it? Is it because somewhere back down the line I turned over a new leaf, made a New Year's resolution and decided to do different? What is my righteousness? What is your righteousness? If we have any tonight, my dear friend, if we have any, any righteousness at all, it's because of what he did That's right. at Calvary. That's right. God took and laid our sins upon him and took his righteousness and clothed us. That's where our righteousness comes from, if we have any. For being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. They have not submitted themselves unto the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Paul said. <coughs> Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. I'm sending you to the Gentiles, Paul. To open their eyes. To what? 
Aren't we going to make children of God out of them? No. <coughs> no, we can't. We couldn't if we wanted to. Thank God for it. What are we going to do? What does preaching do? What's preaching for? Preaching is to feed God's people. People, uh, preaching is to teach God's people that they don't become weak and, and starved. It's to open their eyes to the truths of God's Word and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. Don't say anything about making them children. That's, no, sir. Not a thing. He wasn't sending Paul to make children. That they may receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Let me spend one minute right here on this last part. Are sanctified by faith. Uh, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins. You mean they got to hear the preacher before... The sins are forgiven. No, my friends, the sins were paid for back there. They were paid for in Calvary. All of your sins were laid up on him. And he bore them to that cross. And he paid the sin debt. And the Father was well pleased with you. Well, then what does he mean here when he says that they may receive forgiveness of sin? You learn about that through the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was a fact thousands of years, almost 2,000 years, before you ever heard of it. It was already a fact. It had already taken place. It was finished. It was done. God was pleased with it. Your home was heaven, and you were going to go there regardless of what might happen in this life. You were going to end up in glory one day because of what Christ did for you. But you didn't know that until somebody came along and told you that. That's gospel. That's what the gospel does. And God said, that's what Jesus is telling Paul. That's what I'm sending you to do, to preach the gospel to these people. To preach the gospel to them. Now, i got to get to my text. It's almost time to close, and I ain't got there yet. I guess it's all right. I usually have three points anyway. I take a text, depart from it, and never return to it. So, <clears throat> but over here in the, in the latter part of this 26th chapter, Paul comes down here and, and Festus interrupts this hearing. Festus interrupts it. And he says in verse 24, what? And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself, much learning doth make thee mad. You ever heard anybody say that? You ever heard anybody say that about studying the Bible? Well, my Lord, if you keep that up, you'll go blind. If you keep that up, you'll lose your mind. I had an uncle one time. I remember, and, and, and my grandmother told me that I had a great, great uncle that Lost his mind studying the Bible. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Did you ever hear of anybody losing their mind studying Sports Illustrated? You've never heard that mentioned, have you? No. No, you've never heard that mentioned. But if you don't quit studying that Bible, why? When you talk to it, he just wants to talk about the Bible. Festus said, Paul, much learning. They tell me that you, you read when you're not busy preaching and, and it's not somebody there visiting with you uh, uh, and you're talking to them and talking about the Bible and so forth. They tell me that you're reading, Paul, and, and all this learning has made you mad. Isn't that amazing? But he said, I'm not mad, most noble fasters, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, he's talking about Agrippa now, before whom also I speak freely, for I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, 
For this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. You don't ever hear that preached on, do you? You know why? Because the people we excluded 160 years ago, they took that and went to see with it that this was going to heaven. And our people just steer away from it. Oh, we don't want to get on that. Because they got a song named Almost Persuaded. Well, it's scriptural. Paul said it, preached it, and Agrippa said, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. He didn't say a thing in the world about being persuaded, persuaded to become a child of God. That's not in there. That's not even in the context. I mean, our excluded brothers and sisters, they had to go way out on a limb to get that put in there. It don't say anything about that. It don't even allude to it. It don't mention it. It's not even in the whole context of the chapter. It's not there. Paul's talking to them about his experience. And Paul's telling them about what God has done for him and, and why he's doing what he's doing and why he's in change. Almost. Thou persuadest me to be a Christian. What does Agrippa mean? What does he mean? He's sitting up here in royal garb. He's making a state visit over to uh, Festus. What well, Festus is a governor. Festus is not a king. He's a governor. But Agrippa is a king, but he's a king in another territory. He's making a state visit over here. And so he and Bernice, his sister, and he has another sister, and they're both terrible, terrible women. But they, he has another sister, and here's Agrippa and Bernice, his sister, and Festus. Now Festus has already heard Paul. And now Agrippa's heard him. And now Bernice has heard him. And Agrippa makes his statement. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Now picture if you can. Picture Agrippa sitting here in this royal seat. As a great dignitary. Visiting dignitary. And he's heard this little Jew that's been accused. And this little Jew has chains on him. He's back like he was a real criminal. But this little Jew stands here before him. And he said that was a time when I intended to wipe this name Jesus off of the face of the earth. There was a time when I made havoc of the church. There was a time when I put men and women in prison and I put them in chains and I put them to death. But I did it in ignorance. He tells you that. He writes Timothy and tells Timothy those very things. I did it in ignorance. He said, I'm not mad, Festus. When Agrippa had heard all of that, here's what Agrippa read him in. Paul, almost you have persuaded me to lay aside these royal garments. Almost, Paul, you've persuaded me to give up that throne I have. Almost, Paul, you 
persuaded me to come down and join you. To be a Christian. To be a follower of Jesus Christ. To follow him. To live for him. To die for him if necessary. To be faithful to him. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Being a Christian, being a child of God are two different things altogether. You can be a child of God for 50 years and not be a Christian. But you can't be a Christian one second and not be a child of God. <laughs> it won't work both ways. It won't work both ways. And that's what Agrippa's telling him. Now notice what Paul said. Notice how Paul answers him. And Paul said, I would to God. That not only thou, but all that hear me this day, were both almost and all together such as I am save these bonds. I don't want they, I don't want you to be a prisoner like I am. I don't want you to be in these bonds like I am. But I wish that every one of them were all together persuaded to follow him. What are you talking about, Paul? What are you talking about, Agrippa? Paul's lost his family. Paul's lost everything he's had. He's lost his national family, the Jews. He's lost them. They hate him. They're the ones that brought the charges against him. They're the ones that are trying to get him killed. Paul's lost them. What do you think about that, Paul? Paul, when you think about that in a cold, dark cell at night, Paul, when you're in that Philippian jail, uh, jail and your back was hurting so bad and your hands and feet were in stock, what did you think about it then, Paul? Paul said, well, I looked back and I thought about being a, a rabbi. I thought about being a uh, soul far ahead of my brethren, that I was head and shoulders, stood head and shoulders above them in the Jewish religion. I was well respected and was a part of the Sanhedrin. But I look back to that <coughs> and I count it but dumb. I said one word of thing. Not a thing. Not a thing. I counted all but laws for the excellency. Of what? Not of becoming a child of God. He didn't say anything about that. He said, I counted all but laws, all but done for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Of the knowledge of him. Of what he's done for me. What he is. When you look to the future, Paul, what do you see then? When you look to the future. Well, I want to be faithful. I want to be faithful. And when this life is over, I want to hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I want to hear that more than anything else. Paul, your time is over here. You've been whipped. You've been imprisoned, you've been jailed, you've been shipwrecked, you've been stoned, you've been left to be, you've been lied upon, you've lost everything you had, Paul. 
You don't have a thing in the world. You're just a pauper. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know that. But I'm an heir of God. I'm a child of the King. And I walk with the King day by day. Paul, they're going to put you to death. What do you want, Paul? Second Timothy, end of it, fourth chapter. See, in the first part of Second Timothy, if you'll read it real close, Paul thought he was going to get out of prison again. This was his second embracement. He thought he'd get out and be free again. But if you'll notice in the last part of that book of Second Timothy, you'll find that Paul's language changes. Paul somehow has learned that he'll not get out, that he's condemned to die. Now, Paul, <laughs> since you're not in your own hired house, and since you can't preach, and since you can't have business, and since you're down in that dungeon, way down in that Roman prison, and they condemned you to die, you know you're not going to get out. You know you don't have long to live. You're on death row, according to our saying today. You're on death row. What do you think about it now, Paul? What do you think about this being a Christian business? What do you think about following the Lord Jesus Christ? What do you think about that, that knowledge of Jesus Christ that you told us about a few years ago? You're going to die and forget it all. Isn't that a common saying? Live and learn and die and forget it all. That's what I've heard all my life. You're going to forget it all, Paul. What about it now? Tell us now, Paul, what it means to be a Christian. Read the last verses of 2 Timothy 4. And you'll hear Paul say, I'm ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. It's time for this soul and body to set sail for the heavenly regions while this old body goes back to ashes and to dust. I'm ready to be offered the time of my departures at hand. I've fought a good fight, I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me in that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love me to hear me. What about it, Paul? That's as far as the scripture goes. What I'm going to tell you now, I don't know whether it's so or not, but it's supposed to be. And you can find it in history, but you'll have to look. You won't find it just by reaching up and picking a history book off of it. <coughs> but according to history, they took Paul two miles southwest from the city of Rome in what is called one of the most beautiful valleys of was then. Mm -hmm. One of the most beautiful valleys, green, grassy valley. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. Visit the Primitive Baptist Digital Library for videos, articles, history, hymns, and encouragement. www.primitivebaptist.net